Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Q2 2024 webinar. Nick and I were talking about, we're always excited about our quarterly updates. We spend weeks getting them together, asking the team, you know, how are each of your departments doing, visiting our buildings, working with the accountants, all of those things. And this particular quarter is just really exciting. It's been a good quarter. Yeah, I was thinking about it this morning. And I think the thing, you know, that kind of resonates for me is Real estate is a lot like having a human child or a human or you know a living dog, a puppy, a kitten, whatever it is. Um, it takes a lot of effort when you first acquire something. You have to go in and change everything, work through the business plan, do the renovations. There's always way more headaches than you think. Um, just like you know, through infancy or toddlerhood, like some days are really good, and you're like, oh, we're you know, we're doing well, and then like, and then you have a stretch where it's really, really bad, and you're like, oh, wait a second, and then they mature a little bit, and it's like lovely, and I think maybe that's on my mind because the kids are at these like more grown up summer camps this summer, and our daughter just had her first um, week away at sleepaway camp, and a lot of our portfolio in fund one and fund two has that same sort of feel. Mm -hmm. Like the renovations are done. We're most of the way through our busy leasing season. So we've filled the vacancies that came from those new renovated units. We have the lowest portfolio wide vacancy as of this week that we've had in two years. Uh, yeah. we, we bought all these deep value add assets that we had to do huge renovations on it. And it takes years to, to chunk through hundreds of renovations like that. So it just, it feels good. It does, it does. So this is, a, this is an exciting update for Q2 of 2024. Welcome to everyone who's attending live or catching the replay. We do try to make this interactive. Rachel's here to support us and to support you. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're joining from. And then if you have any questions, you know, per usual, pop those into the chat. We try to address them as we go along, if we're able to, or we make sure that we hit all of those at the end. Since we do these over kind of the lunch hour in our time zone at Central Time Zone, and for many of you, um, we do try to keep these a little bit shorter. So we move a little bit faster than say like our community power hours that go in the evening. We have a, an awesome presentation for you guys. Hello, Jenny, Jessica. Lots of folks are joining us. Bruce, Vanessa, so good to see all of you. Lots of names I recognize, some newer investors. So welcome to our community, Matthew, Michelle. Awesome. All right, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get our, our slides reshared. And let's get started, shall we? Yeah. Awesome. All right, our slide share should be up now. Our usual disclaimer, um, in our presentation, this is for informational purposes. This is a combination of historical data, which is you know based in fact, based on real actual stories and numbers. Throughout the presentation, there are some forward-looking statements as we describe what we predict will come ahead in the coming quarters. This is not a solicitation to sell securities. Our funds are open to accredited investors only. They're Reg D 506C. And we always recommend that you speak with your personal advisors before making any investment decisions. Investments do have risk, including real estate. Our usual disclaimers. And our usual about us. We're about to update this because we're finally buying stuff again. And, and these numbers are going to go up in a big way here soon. But uh, we've got about a third of a billion assets under management. We're a real estate private equity firm. We're a uh, Vertically integrated, we've got an amazing property management company, an amazing real estate sales team. We've done a little bit of ground up construction there, as you can see. Uh, if this is your first time with us, that's just a, a little bit about us and uh, why uh, you know we, we speak with some authority. We've been doing this for a while. We do it at a, a fairly significant scale. And this is uh, you know kind of a fun town hall uh, format. We still love to get together with our investors and answer their questions and let them know how things are going, uh, despite the fact that we've got a, a fair amount of uh, properties that we manage. Today was such a, a fun day. We actually spent the more, well, we spent the weekend doing a coaching event around time management, um, leading teams, those sorts of things. It's a ton of fun when Nick and I get to have that dedicated, focused time together. Um, and then we spent the morning touring one of the assets that's going into fund three and fund four that we're closing on in about a week or so. We're buttoning up all the final paperwork. Um, but we've actually started working with the property management companies for the property management transition. And then we get to do this webinar. So it's just a ton of fun. We love to- A day in flow. Yeah, a day in flow. We love to be in the thick of it. We you know, are very hands-on with our portfolio. We're, our full-time careers are inside of Black Swan Living managing this portfolio. Kind of the most important update that investors like to hear about is distributions. 
Um, all of the funds are going exactly according to plan. We're so excited about that in general. And then particularly in the headwinds that have come in the industry in the last couple of years. Um, fund one is doing monthly distributions, you know, technically per our operating agreement, we should be doing quarterly distributions, but we had an idea that we would do some fixed distributions this year. So we did 4% annually split up over those 12 monthly payments. So far, we're at 14.3% of capital returned in fund one. Fund two had a distribution at the end of 2023, and we're targeting a potential distribution at the end of this year, pending our residents at Discovery Square status, which we'll get into um, in our updates. And then fund three, which is you know relatively brand new, it just finished uh, filling in late February. We'll have distributions starting in 2025. All of the distributions should be going direct deposit straight into your bank account. There's a few folks who get paper checks if you have, say, like a retirement account or something like that. If you ever need to change that information, you can do that inside of your portal, blackswan.investnext.com. And if you ever have any concerns, you can send an email to Rachel and she will do any technical troubleshooting that's needed. I'm very excited about our distributions. Yep, fun. So Fund three, I think, is going to start distributions faster than any vehicle we've ever had. Uh, now is the time to buy. The, the The buying opportunities that we have in the marketplace are just, uh, it, it breaks my heart. We can't buy everything. There's just so many opportunities hitting hitting our email inbox every day. And uh, and fund four is open if, uh, if anyone wants to, to get invested. Absolutely. Some frequently asked questions. Um, lots of you are in the process of filing your personal tax returns. So K-1s for the tax year of 2023 for Fund 1, Fund 2, and then all of our historical joint ventures have gone out. Those come to you in two different ways. It's the exact same form. It's just to get to you in two different ways. Um, the first is directly to your email via the sender safe send returns. And then the second way is that they are all uploaded into your Invest Next portal. You can kind of think of that as like your filing cabinet so that you have access to that document for years to come. And then one thing to remember is that because Fund 3 was created in February of 2024, it will not get a K-1 for the 2023 tax year. So you can think of it as if you are a Black Swan investor, you have received all of your tax forms for the year. No more forms are needed to go out. As Nick mentioned, Fund 4 is open, blackswanfund4.com. We've had a ton of success with that. It's going super well. We're super excited about the acquisition. That's why we were hanging out at Georgetown this morning, working with the property management there for the transition, checking on some of the renovations that are happening. Um, it is just such a lovely community, especially like in the thick of the summer. It's on a 17 acre, like wooded campus, and it just looks beautiful this time of year. I want, I want to break on the team for a second. So uh, Georgetown, you know, one of our biggest things is to improve management of the asset and uh, Douglas Trail townhomes, uh, like our next door, you know, very similar asset. There's no vacancies there. And so we've actually started filling vacancies at Georgetown before we even close on the asset because we have excess, you know, leads that, that we can that we can place in that asset that's right next door. It's an easy thing to do. So we've actually, uh, I believe we, we signed and paid six leases last week. Uh, last week was our best leasing week in uh, like 18 months for the company or 15 months for the company. And we just had an exceptionally successful leasing week, so much so that we leased half a dozen units of an asset we don't even own yet. Uh, so we're getting a running start on, on Georgetown there. It was just incredible. And while you're bragging on our team, I will brag on you because I will say all of that comes from your ability to think about win-win deals. And, and I have to admit, like, even having been married to you for what, almost like 14 years now in business with you all of these years, like, it still surprises me because I still am like, Nick, most people don't manage assets they don't yet own that have a property manager in place. And you're like, well, I worked it out with the owner and it's a win-win for all of us because then we get the, you know, in, in Rochester, the, the summer season is huge for leasing, right? Yeah. We get more of that. We, we have know. to lease everything before September 1st. Or it might be vacant through the winter. Yeah. So, so we, like it makes a ton of sense, but I'm just really proud of you that the way you think about how can I work hard, right? It's hard work to, and we're not getting compensated as a property manager for that. We're simply doing it to set the we assets. We don't collect the rent. They, yeah. the, the, the current owner gets the rent, but we get a unit that's full when we close and it's a tenant that we've placed that's gone through our background check process, that's gone through our compliance process. Uh, so yeah, so it's a win-win deal. And we've never done that before. Maybe that should be our SOP is, hey, uh, can we start leasing units for you? Oh my gosh, closing? so funny. I'm just so proud of you. Like even just in this moment, the way you just like, yeah, of course I would do this. Like 
it's, it's just like breathing air. It's like, of course, I would do this and excited about that. I'm mm -hmm. proud of the work you're doing there. Um, when is our next in-person event? Um, it is September 12th through the 15th of 2025. Make sure you note that's of 2025. We've already had our 2024 event for the year, but we are planning that. We are super excited about it. It is going to be our best event yet. We're like already meeting with our event coordinator, already meeting with the hotel space, already thinking about speakers and content. So you can get on the wait list at rerl2025.com. So it's a tough time in the marketplace right now. You know, the vast majority of private equity funds, real estate syndications in the real estate space, multifamily space have suspended distributions or doing capital calls or, or outright announcing a complete loss of LP capital. Uh, we have had no capital calls. We're actively doing distributions uh, kind of on track with our business plan. Uh, we're aggressively seeking out new acquisitions right now. Our deals are doing doing quite well. So, so how the heck did we did we manage to achieve that? And if you go look at our webinars uh, from you know a couple of years ago, we were kind of you know up on a soapbox about hey, we see a lot of people in the industry that are getting variable rate debt instruments when rates are at all time lows, and like that just doesn't seem like a good decision to us. And then you get these rate caps, these insurance policies that could get way more expensive in the future, and they're buying a lot of assets in Texas and Florida states that you know when there's a hurricane insurance goes up a couple of years later. Like that's how it works. Like, I don't think anyone, I don't, it doesn't feel like a particularly genius insight to say, Hey, if rates are at the lowest time in history, do you think they're going to stay that low? They're, they're probably going to go up. And you know, if there was like three hurricanes this year and insurance is probably going to go up a lot here in a couple of years. So we, you know, we, we just followed our own advice and we bought uh, with fixed rate debt, with no rate caps in, uh, you know, temperate uh, blue ocean markets. Uh, you know, we have vertically integrated property management, construction, maintenance, everything lets us control costs. And uh, these are the things that allowed us to stay on our business plan. We're unbelievably excited about you know, how our assets are performing. It would be easier for us if rates were lower. Uh, but to a great extent, the, the beautiful thing about the, the real estate industry is that all we have to do is stay in the game. Like time uh, rewards you. Time is on your side. So all you have to do is stay in the game and you're going to be exceptionally uh, successful. Our, our new debt for Georgetown, uh, you know, rates have kept edging down here on five-year treasury. So we might cross 5.5% for our new debt on Georgetown. So a lot of people out there getting debt quoted at seven and a half, eight and a half percent. So it is possible now to get low rate debt. Uh, and I think it's going to get a lot better in the future. Uh, and, and we just, we, we bought, you know, good assets in good locations with the future in mind with fixed rate debt and no rate caps. And that's allowed us to do, uh, you know, extraordinarily well during a, a time of, of, uh, of tumult in, in the industry. Absolutely. Um, good question came in when distributions are on hold or not yet or have not yet started for a fund, does Black Swan provide reports at regular intervals listing additional return on investments such as property appreciation for investors? That's a really good question. Um, so it's important to note that all of our funds are exactly on track, all the way back to fund one, our historical JVs that we did for years and years before that. We generally predict that we won't have distributions in the first about year to 18 months because that's the capital intensive part of the investment. That's when we're acquiring the asset, doing renovations, all of the vacancy that's associated associated with renovations. And then about a year or so after ownership of a building, that's when you start to move a lot of those renovations along. Folks move into those now renovated units. The common area improvements have finished, those sorts of things. So then distributions start. And that's exactly what we've seen in fund one and fund two. Fund three is you know still very brand new. Fund four is open as we speak. We do not um, give our estimates on property value unless we have an appraisal in hand. So for example, we have our own spreadsheets that we share with each other and we share internally as to what we think a building is worth. We don't share those with our investors because we consider that to be a worse practice, that that would be based on our opinion and not based on a neutral third party like a broker's price opinion or what's the best in the industry is an appraisal. But when we get an appraisal, either at time of acquisition or most importantly, at time of a cash out refi, then absolutely we share that value. But I hope that makes sense to people that we feel like it would be like a bit of a roller coaster for us yeah. to share what we think the value is if we haven't had that third party appraised. And appraisals are expensive and take a ton of time. So the only time we would do appraisals. Ideally do three appraisals if you're going to you know produce an assessment. Like we're very elated to share that Colby, uh, we've only had one appraisal done this year on an existing asset. So Colby appraised at $3.7 million. We were, we only paid $2.4 million for that asset nine months before. So like we made a million dollars in nine months on that asset, according to the appraised value, 
we had a suspicion it was worth, you know, about 3.4, 3.5 million. I don't disagree with the appraiser at 3.7. I think that's a realistic valuation as well. But we want to have a, a like a like a, a you know, rigorous third party appraisal in hand if we share that information with our investors. Absolutely. So great question there. I hope that clarification helps. For the rest of the um, presentation, we're going to go kind of market wide down into the specific assets. So we'll start with um, talking about what's happening at Mayo. Many of you have probably already heard us talk about this. If you haven't, it's super important to understand why we're in Rochester, Minnesota, why we're super excited about what Mayo's doing. Um, so I'll keep it a little bit short since this is probably our third time that we've updated on this. We've always known that Mayo would have a large expansion. We've been following the Destination Medical Center initiative for many, many years. That's been unfolding in Rochester for about seven or eight years now. But we really thought that Mayo's expansion would come in probably another, say, five years. And they actually announced the expansion in the fall of 2023, a little less than a year ago. It's called Bold Forward Unbound. You could just like Google that and read, you know, all of the news about it. It's a $5 billion expansion in the city of Rochester. And keep in mind, Rochester is about 150, 165,000 people. So $5 billion in any city. That's two is Amazon HQ2s. If you remember Amazon HQ2, this huge thing, it's two of those, but on Midwestern dollars, which is probably double that number again. So it's like four Amazon HQ2s in a town of 160,000 people. Yeah, so it's super exciting. And we've strategically built much of the portfolio around that. So this is a map that many of you have seen before. I encourage you to take a look at it because we're always adding to it as we have new acquisitions. Um, the dark blue buildings are the Mayo buildings that are patient care. The light blue buildings are non-patient care buildings like admin, lab, those sorts of things. And then the teal buildings are the, what's called the hospital of the future. That's Mayo's brand for, for this expansion, the hospital of the future. Um, so those are being built. Like as we're driving by, there's cranes and bulldozers and fencing up and just all of the activity. Lots that of comes, demolition right now. That comes from construction. Um, and then all of the stars are Black Swan owned properties owned across our historical portfolio, our joint ventures, fund one, two, three. And I don't think there's anything on here right now for fund four, but there may be as we continue our acquisitions for fund four. So very exciting. And then not only does this inform, we call this our downtown campus, but all of Rochester is just booming around this population growth, this job growth the jobs that are coming in now for construction workers to physically build these buildings over the next many years. Um, eventually the additional patient volume, the additional healthcare jobs. Um, it's just so exciting to live in a city that's in like its adolescence. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really growing up. It's, it's a fun time. Some of the capital projects that are happening in our community right now, in addition to Hospital of the Future. So the uh, rapid transit system, it's a $143 million project, uh, Broadway Avenue upgrade, $12.2 million project, uh, strategic redevelopment, $38 million project. Again, this is a town of 160,000 people. So the it's you know, it's like Dubai here. If uh, you come out for the event, you get to experience that. There's cranes in the air everywhere. Uh, and we've built this, you know, this this portfolio in the in the heart of all this activity. So just a little bit about the exciting things that are happening in Rochester here. We've got a couple updates for our uh, property management company. Black Should we do a little drum roll? Oh, yeah. So this is exciting. Yay. So we've been nominated for best of the best. Uh, this is a, a huge local celebrity thing. So the, the big local newspaper uh, has these rankings uh, that they, they do every year, kind of like consumer reports or whatever, and local uh, residents of Rochester vote on this. Although you too can vote if you would like. I'm sure Rachel would be happy to share that link. If you want to go vote for us, you're more than welcome to. We would love it if yes. you would vote for us. This is yep. huge in terms of, can you get your sign right there? Uh, pull pull oh, yeah. it down from the wall. So, so we were rated best of the best in 2023. We get these signs and we put them up at every building. We put it in all of our resident facing marketing. Um, it helps a ton in terms of, you know, people are shopping. They're often shopping. Put on from, the back of our service trucks. And... Yeah, they're often shopping from outside of Rochester. They're, you know, moving here for residency, fellowship, some type of career at Mayo or career at one of the destination medical center places, something like that. And they're making a lot of their decisions based on internet and phone marketing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so anything that we can share with them that's you know, an objective thing outside of us of, hey, go look at our Google reviews. Hey, here we were rated best of the best in our community. It helps a ton with our lead conversion and helping them to feel very comfortable with choosing to, to live with us during their time in Rochester. So please do vote. You can vote once per day. Um, we have a fun ritual as a team. Every morning we put little um, like things in our, in our group chat of like fireworks and Taylor Swift and other things. So like, make sure you're voting. Um, so very excited about that. Tell your that. family to vote. Tell your friends to vote. This, this is our first year being nominated for best place to work. Mm -hmm. That's a new nomination for us. So we're competing with the Mayo Clinic. So I don't have, I don't think we're going to win that one. We're it's, over 50 employees now. So we're now in that 50 plus employee bracket. That's a tough, that's some tough competition there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just so much gratitude to our team who literally works around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, holidays, every if it's 100 degrees out, which is hot for us in Rochester, if it's negative 40 degrees, whatever it is, they're out there serving all of our residents now, both our long-term and our short-term portfolio, serving all of our investors. Um, just so grateful to them and excited for this nomination. And we'll see if we can go head-to-head -head with Mayo Clinic. Yep. We have a several orders of magnitude, fewer employees to yeah. vote for us, but we're going to go for it. I'm actually I'm actually worried <laughs> if we beat Mayo because that that's... <laughs> pretty bad. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to geek out with y'all for just a second here. Uh, so this is a huge thing that we push. Uh, you see that little spreadsheet there. These are, uh, so we have some amazing remote staff in the Philippines and they do some, some uh, just incredible work. They look at every single utility bill for every single unit in every single property, every single month and uh, put together a whole analytics, uh, you know, kind of a set, set of KPIs that uh, that I take a look at and our maintenance director takes a look at and our operations director takes a look at. So if our water bill goes up, we notice that. Um, and then we've put, uh, just done a huge push on, on utility efficiency. So just zooming into one particular asset here, City Hall. Uh, it has some electric heaters, uh, commercial, you know, electric heaters in the entryways. We did a tune up on those tune up the air conditioning system. We moved all the, the laundry facilities to uh, to inside the units, which uh, helps boost rent because now you have this huge amenity that you can offer tenants, but also significantly reduces the utility expenses for the buildings. Those washers and dryers are the highest utility consumption devices in the entire building, even higher than, uh, than HVAC, depending on the time of year and stuff like that. Uh, that also allowed us to shut down this uh, very large, expensive exhaust system for the laundromat because we have these ultra high tech uh, condensing washing machines that require no HVAC ventilation. So that further reduces the HVAC load on the building. Uh, we dialed back our water heater temperature uh, to 120 degrees at 140 degrees. Not only does that increase the life of the water heater and uh, it's you know good for the environment, it's just pure energy savings, uh, but it significantly reduces our, our energy consumption. Uh, we, we, we dialed it back a little bit over time and uh, and no one complained, or I think maybe we got one complaint. I, I think maybe one tenant noticed out of the, out of the whole building. Um, the, the, there's a million things I could speak to, very nerdy ways that we really aggressively optimize these utility costs, but uh, you probably really just care about the outcome. So in May 2023, this was already after we had moved a bunch of laundry into units, maybe half the units in the building. Our May 2023 electric bill on that asset, $933. Our May 2024 electric bill, $322. So we reduced that electric bill by two thirds year over year, which is a staggering savings because you, you, know, you, you multiply that by 12. And then you multiply that by 20 to see the impact that that has on the asset value. Uh, some buildings have benefited more than others. I mean, we've done huge, huge, huge energy improvements at, at all of our buildings, but some just had more, uh, you know, low hanging fruit that we could claim than others. City Hall was one of those. Uh, our most recent gas bill. So uh, this is the June, June gas bill uh, was $97. That's the lowest gas bill ever. In fact, it's half of our lowest, like our next lowest gas bill. That's because we turned down our gas water heater in the winter when the furnaces were running. And now that the furnaces are off in the summer, we finally see what is the gas bill just run that water heater for a month. And that gas bill is less than half of the next lowest bill ever for that building. So these may not seem like huge things, but in aggregate, it adds up to millions of dollars of value that's created for the portfolio. And ultimately, this is like the most virtuous way we could ever drive profit, isn't it? You know, we could raise rents. Uh, we can, you know, lower expenses in some areas that, that maybe like lower our, you know, our customer service level. Maybe we're mowing the lawns a little bit less or something like that. But at the end of the day, if we can just reduce utility bills, like it's good for the environment, it's good for the tenant, it's good for us. It's, it's just a win for absolutely everyone involved. And we have saved a staggering amount of money across our portfolio in, uh, in utility efficiency improvement. 
That's uh, just, uh, I could talk about this for hours. We spend a lot of time agonizing over analytics on these utility bills. Here's just one for, uh, one example for you to look at. Uh, an excellent question. Um, do utilities get transitioned? And by that, I think the question means build. Do utilities get billed to the tenants or isn't it overall savings to the asset? So this is pure savings to the asset. So all residents across all multifamily units in the portfolio pay a $75 per month, what we call property services fee that covers whatever shared utilities are in that building. Every building's a little bit different. Um, and then also things like common area cleaning, lawn, snow, landscaping, those sorts of things. Um, and so when we drive down these, when we drive up these savings by driving down these costs, that stays directly at, at the asset level. So that's directly impacting our distributions, our cash out refi, the value of the buildings, the return to investors. Very, very good question there. Yep. All right. Next up, we have a just a fun, quick little snippet to share for vertical integration. So vertical integration means that we're looking at all of the major things that we need to service our buildings and bringing as many as we can in-house in order to decrease costs and increase control and quality. And so one of those examples is we've built a construction renovation team over the last about 15 months or so. They principally do renovations in the units, generally at about half the cost than what we're able to do with vendors. And then we're also able to move them a little more fluidly of, you know, well, this building you know, is kind of going a little bit faster. Let's move our teams over here, those sorts of things. So one of the things that we unfortunately needed to do in this picture further on the left is you can see this garage unit. This is at um, Douglas Trail Townhomes. Um, each of these units has their own separate garage, kind of like what you might find on a single family home. And unfortunately, just the way this one was settling into the ground, it no longer met building code. Um, so it needed to come down. And we had vendor bids for $50,000 that were weeks and weeks out. We would have failed to be in compliance with the city in terms of permitting our rental licensing, those sorts of things, because this was a bit of a safety concern as that garage was settling into the ground. So we had our in-house team do it, um, and our in-house cost was only $25,000, and we completed it in under two weeks. So we were able to shift resources and say, hey, this is the biggest priority in the portfolio so that we can stay in compliance with city code and all of that. So this is a like a perfect example, you know, sometimes we do like longer presentations around vertical integration, or we teach like all the different line items of property management, maintenance, cleaning, lawn, snow, all of those things. But I find that it's really helpful to hear just like a quick story. We cut the cost in half and we cut the timeline probably, probably went from like amount. 20 weeks to yeah. two weeks. Yeah. Um, and then we also were able to do it in just a few days, which is of course great for the resident living in that unit that you know, the construction just finishes and, and their lives, the, the disruption is minimized. And I look, I think it looks damn good. So they actually salvaged the vinyl siding off the garage. So it's faded in and then they mixed it in. That's Scotty on the ladder there. And uh, one of our other construction guys on the ground, like it is really hard to chop a garage off a building and have it look good when you get done. Like uh, this is like art in my mind. Like it, yeah, I think someone driving, you know, past the building, they would never notice that there wasn't a garage there. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that all the other units do have a garage on them. So just truly masterpiece work in a really small amount of time for just a fraction of the cost of vending this out. Yeah, absolutely. Next up is renewals. Renewals is like that quiet part of the business that often doesn't get a ton of attention that actually is a huge driver of the success or failure of a real estate portfolio. And renewal, believe it or not, actually starts like, a few weeks before a resident ever moves in for the first time. That's when you're, you know, the, the saying in life, like you never get a second time to make a first impression. It's absolutely true. So what the experience is like as the resident is moving in, what the unit is like as, the, you know, the day they move in, the customer service that they receive, and then all through their tenancy, how do we handle maintenance requests? How do we handle questions that come up? Do we have resident events? Do they feel like they're part of a community? Like they're, they're getting more for their dollars than, you know, simply a place to live. They're getting, you know, part of their identity, part of feeling like they belong, part of feeling like they're well, well cared, cared for. And so... We have a dedicated person who handles all of our renewals. Her name is Laura. This is a picture of her at our event, I think, last year. 
Um, and she handles an individual touch to every single person in the portfolio, asking them how has their experience been, what are their plans for the coming year, offering them their lease renewal, signing all of the paperwork. It's an extraordinary amount of work, an extraordinary amount of customer service that needs to happen. And it lends to really good outcomes. So in all business, keeping a customer is way more profitable than creating a new customer. But particularly in real estate, we were actually talking about that this morning, talking about turnovers at Georgetown, because there's so much effort that has to go into a turnover in terms of touching up paint and trim and a deep clean and carpet cleaning and all of those things. Um, so you ideally want to keep people in renewals and you need to do so with rent growth. Portfolio wide, we're at 6.6% rent growth on renewals only. That, not, not new leases. Not new Just, leases, yeah. right? New leases are way higher because that's usually when we're doing our renovations, those sorts of things. And then despite that relatively high escalation rate, we're at a 51% renewal rate. So very happy with that mix of data there. And it's helped with our profitability for the portfolio, maintaining stability. We think it's good for communities when people live in their living situations for longer. It helps us with maintenance of the unit, knowing those residents, all of the things. So just super excited about that. I know Laura often listens to the um, to our presentation. So if you're listening today, thank you so much for all of your hard work. It does not go unnoticed. It's a, it's this quiet, steady thing mm -hmm. that it's, you know, it's kind of like a big victory when, you know, a leasing agent comes in, oh, I got a lease signed or I got a paid security deposit. And Laura is just kind of quietly processing all of the paperwork and phone calls and lease signings and everything that need to happen for renewals. And so we wanted to make sure we give her a huge I mean, shout out. She's, she outperforms the rest of our leasing team combined, right? Cause she, she signed Half of our leases. Half of our leases. 50, 50 yeah. percent of them. <laughs> it is, it's also valuable to contrast, you know, industry-wide. Uh, right now, I'd say the industry is looking at like a negative 2% rent growth rate on renewals, depending on your market, uh, you know, asset class grade, stuff like that, with a 40 to 50% renewal rate. It's a brutal time out there. There's a lot of new uh, units coming online and, you know, your tenants will leave if the you know, asset down the street is offering them, you know, three months free rent with a new lease or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's not uncommon for people to get no, uh, no rent escalation or a negative uh, rent escalation at renewal. And uh, Laura has been crushing it and our portfolio has just, just continued to shine through this process. Next up is our update on short-term rentals. Since many of the buildings across the whole portfolio have short-term rental units now, you can kind of think of this as a portfolio wide update. And then we'll try to specifically call out buildings um, as we're able to. Short-term rentals are going extremely well. Um, talk about like raising a baby. <laughs> we have raised a baby in the last nine or 10 months going from zero short-term rentals. We historically for the last you know, 13 years of our business have been 100% long-term rentals. Um, and then we saw an inflection point in the post-COVID market um, even before Mayo had announced their expansion, probably by about two months. So that was just kind of all serendipitous that that came together. But basically, you can think of Rochester as a tourist town, right? We're a medical tourism town and travel plummeted through COVID. Um, and now it is picking back up as the world is opening back up, all of those sorts of things. Mayo wants to be the destination medical center of the world. And so we started um, doing some short-term rental units in about September, September yeah, of September last Boston. year. Um, and it's been an extraordinary undertaking. Um, and we're so excited about it. By May 6th of this year, we had 28 active units. And by July 8th, which is only about 60 days apart, we had 47. So in the first, say, like seven months of our operations, we went from zero to 28. And then in the subsequent two months, we went from 28 to 47. That's the growth of a business. We've seen that time and time again with the businesses that we've run before our real estate portfolio, our own real estate portfolio, the service lines that we have inside of our property management company. This is what it takes to gather up all of those resources, create the systems and processes, iron out the early kinks, build the team, train the team, figure out what the problems are, and then troubleshoot and build around them. Um, so very excited about that. I think our team is like, finally starting to feel like they can breathe a little, yeah. you know, it was, it's it was been intense. It was intense for them. And it's so fun to see, you know, in the eyes of our team, how capable they feel that if we had said to them, you know, at the beginning of the year in say like January, when we had been doing short-term rentals for about three months, Hey, by summer, you'll be running 47. Like, I think they would have fainted. 
Like it, it just would have been like unfathomable to them. And now they're doing it and they're doing it with relative ease, right? There's still a lot of growth. We're still furnishing more units, um, but it's just so neat to see that growth happen in them as well. 100% of our units are online at Residence of Discovery Square in time for our refinance this fall. That's huge. So we built out um, about two thirds, maybe 70% of the ground floor commercial space at Residence of Discovery Square that was vacant when we acquired it. Some portion of it, the city is requiring that we reserve for a commercial tenant, but we were able to put residential units in the rest of that square footage. And that's been extremely successful. Um, every quarter that we've been eligible, we've earned super host status. So we just got notification of that, what, like three weeks ago for which this is, quarter. Which is really difficult when you're bringing on like, you know, three units, four units a week. It's it's difficult to, to, to maintain that, that level of quality. The team's just done a phenomenal job. Um, and then about 10% or so of our bookings come from direct bookings, which are much more lucrative because then we're able to minimize fees for both the guest and for, you know, ultimate profitability that goes to that asset. So blackswanstay.com is for our direct bookings. And we have a surprise amount of repeat business here. You know, someone might come in, say, July, do some testing and those sorts of things at Mayo, head home, and then come back a quarter from now to maybe have a procedure or a checkup or those sorts of things. Um, and so people like that certainty, too, that they're coming to a place where they know where they're staying, they know the team. And so it's just a win-win for everyone for those direct bookings. So here's a little chart on our uh, revenue growth, or you can just think about it this way. In the last 30 days, we've had $116,000 in SDR revenue, which is more than all of Q1 combined. Uh, so whenever you can make a statement like that, uh, that, that sounds pretty good. That, that feels pretty good. Uh, just a, a tremendous amount of growth here with our, our SDR line of business. Uh, but are we making money at that? So uh, look at uh, at June here. If you if you look at how much we could have made by renting all those units unfurnished versus how much we made after the it's, it's a lot more expenses, a lot more expenses involved with operating short term rentals. So if you look at the, the higher gross revenue, less those additional expenses, uh, we increased portfolio wide NOI by about seven thousand uh, dollars. If you annualize that, that's about eighty two thousand uh, dollars. And then at a five cap five percent capitalization rate, this would increase the value of our portfolio by about one point six million dollars. So uh, I, I think that's tremendous value creation. I mean, if uh, if if this whole effort did nothing but allow us to to get to a really good spot for our refi on RDS this fall, then this effort has been a success. Uh, but so far, like it's it's been it's been doing pretty well. Uh, at first, we were just kind of playing with house money, working with uh, units that probably would have been vacant otherwise in that winter season. And then we started dialing in what units were kind of more profitable, doing more of those, doing less of the units that were less profitable. This winter, we'll probably go do a pretty aggressive reshuffle where we actually wind up or eliminate the short-term rental units that are kind of the, the least successful ones and, you know, move those furnishings over to units and to buildings that we're discovering are more profitable. And that's just been a really surprising process. At the end of the day, uh, you don't really know what the market's going to, you know, do what, how it's going to respond. Uh, so we've just done, you know, a, a couple of units in many different buildings, different unit types to, to see what the market demands. And, uh, and, and then this winter we'll have a huge kind of reorganization where we, really lean into what the market demands. And I'm excited about what our profitability looks like for the high season uh, next year when uh, when we really have everything dialed in. Mm -hmm. And all of fund one, fund two, fund three, um, they all have short-term rentals across the various buildings. Yep. Let's dive into specific updates for fund one. This is our most mature fund. So things are you know kind of slow and steady and, and doing really well. This is Nicholas. Um, fund one was a $10 million fund closed in December of 2021. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing monthly distributions in 2024, totaling 4%. And then we anticipate a Q4 distribution as well after the refi of um, RDS because fund one owns half of RDS. Really steady performance. It also has um, a portfolio of single family homes. Um, the Nicholas, you know, kind of the story on the Nicholas was you know, like a year ago, we were reporting around some of the renovations we were doing, some of the common area improvements, the management changes. And then for about the past, I don't know, I would say year or so, it's really just been steady. It yep. performs extremely well. It's one of the, it's one of the only multifamily buildings that's in the middle of the two Mayo campuses. So Mayo has kind of what you can think about as like an outpatient campus and then an inpatient campus. And this property is smack in the middle, which is somewhat rare. Usually like kind of the housing is kind of clustered around each of those campuses. Um, so it leases very, very well. 
It's also relatively new. It was built in 2015. So all of the finishes are great. People love it. Tall ceilings, lots of natural light, those sorts of things. Very sustained rent growth. So you can see in January of 2022, our average rental rate was probably around 13, say 1325 or so. And in June of 2024, we're probably at about 1750, maybe 1725. Massive so growth. So really massive growth. Again, you know, as Nick mentioned, at a time when rental rates around the country have historically been dropping um, in that post-pandemic time frame, Rochester has continued to do so well because of the growth of Rochester and then because of our property management and how much time and effort we spend thinking about. Um, prospective residents and marketing and what the leasing experience is like for them and the customer service experience. It, it's, it's, it's somewhat hard, like when we're talking with like established professionals, like if you're on this call, you're probably a professional. And so the things we say, you might be like, really, is that it? Like, it's really as simple as like, we answer our phone. Yep. If you call our line, someone will answer and answer your question, get you scheduled um, for an appointment with a leasing agent, walk you through the process to apply, like whatever it is that the need is. That is not the norm in the industry. And think about the times in your life when you've been searching for housing. Like that's kind of a stressful time for people. And human nature is like, you just want to finish it, right? Like you're like, okay, I have a week to shop. I want to get this done. I want to make a decision. I want to have that dopamine of like, I've made my decision. I know where I'm going to live. I can start changing my mail and planning out my furnishings and all of that. And in the time that it takes other property management companies to just return the call, We've already done the application, completed the background check, shown them units, signed a lease, paid the deposit. And then the other property manager calls, oh, I saw you called about like ABC apartments. And they're like, sorry, I've already rented from Black Swan. And you see that in our, our more mature assets than like Nicholas. We have four short-term rentals at Nicholas. We're going to roll out six additional short-term rentals because those have been pretty successful there, which makes sense, right? Given that it's in between the two campuses. Jenny Ekstrom asked, do you hire from the hospitality uh, sector for those roles? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. We try hard to yep. never, ever, ever hire someone with previous property management experience because their expectation for customer service is just so abysmally low. So we hire from the service sectors, we hire servers, and our favorite sector to hire from is the hospitality sector. If you are a front desk manager at a hotel, you are going to do an amazing job answering the phone for our company. And that was all very serendipitous. We've been hiring from hospitality years before we ever knew we would do short-term rentals um, because they just have a different level of customer service. They expect that when a guest walks into a hotel, they're right there to answer the question, right? Um, and so we wanted that in our property management portfolio. And then as it turns out, we've kind of evolved into having an arm of the portfolio that's more of a hospitality business. And so it's been wonderful. And those folks have you know so much training, so much history, they know the systems and processes. They know the, like the exact sheets to buy and the exact washing machines to buy and all of the things. It's, it's been great. Jenny also asked, uh, have you stayed at the $100 a night level for uh, rental rates on your short-term rentals? Uh, so uh, we are constantly experiencing, experimenting with different uh, pricing management practices. Elaine will tell you I'm managing our pricing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, right now, our rev bar is $96 per night at a 97% occupancy rate. So that tells you our, our average daily rate is about $99. Uh, and, and you heard me correctly, 97% occupancy. We have an, like an extraordinarily high occupancy rate, uh, which means we can probably push up our ADR, which we've been doing. So every week, our ADR goes up you know, a couple of bucks or something like that, which is, which is massive. And we've been able to maintain occupancy. Uh, I could spend a long time talking about that. but mm -hmm. And then we do have our cleaning question. fee on top of that. As yes. well. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, one night stay on average, you know, is, is going to be, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Yep. yep, absolutely. Let's talk about resident Dis at Discovery Square. This is half owned by Fund One and Fund Two. I would say 2024 and most of 2023 has really been the story of RDS. Um, so, we acquired this building. It was a relatively new building, it was built in 2019. The upper levels were all established multifamily units doing fairly well. Of course, we had, you know, some management improvements and rental escalations and those sorts of things, renegotiated our lease with University of Minnesota, Rochester. But really the story of RDS has been finishing the construction. So just the, the timeline of this building's birth was unfavorable. It came online in fall of 2019. We all know what happened in Q1 of 2020. And the building just kind of stagnated for several years until we acquired it 
So we um, built residential units in about 70% of the vacant commercial space in the common area or in the ground floor. Um, and then we put in this parking lot, which is huge for um, residents. And then also that future commercial space that there really wasn't parking. If there's say a restaurant or a coffee shop there, there really wasn't parking. Well, now we have that. So we'll be able to um, be stronger in terms of attracting a commercial tenant for the space that is left. I think as of like mid-April or late April, we got all of our certificates of occupancy. So that was huge to pull off. So we acquired this in October, of, I'm sorry, in April of 2023. We got it under contract in October of 2022, acquired it in April of 2023, immediately got to work on pulling all the permits, doing all the work, and then um, completed all of the construction by April of 2020 four so that we could generate the revenue to support the refi that's happening in October of 2024. We'll talk to that here in just one second. Yeah, that's been that's been Nick's like big rock of the year. Yeah. So we have 16 short-term rental units, five long-term rental units. Our common areas are complete. You used to just kind of walk into this building and it was just like a, it almost kind of looked like you were walking into like a parking garage. It was just like empty like concrete space there, you know, off to the side was like the mailboxes, but there really wasn't much going on. And now we have much like you might find in a hotel, like all these different kind of unique seating areas with different furniture and different vibes, games, books, those sorts of things. Um, and then we completed the parking lot. We have a theater room. We've added some other amenities to the building to really class up the building. It's a class A building and we're trying to move it more toward like a class A plus building Everything here was completed on time and on budget, which is huge during a period of historic inflation, historic labor shortages. Um, this one's been fun. Mm -hmm. Like it, it all through all of this, like it was never like stressful. It was always just like a little stressful for me, it was, but it's it very fun. It was like like a buzzing bee, mm -hmm. you know, like you would walk into we'll just, have like 10 staff people there at any given time. There's just so much activity in this building. Yeah, yeah. And just like Amazon deliveries every day of you know, huge pallets of stuff for all of our short term they, rentals. They were sending us an entire truck, like an entire UPS truck would show up uh, day after day just just for us at this building. It's It's been so fun. And it's it's nice to see this building maturing this year as well. So all right, the, here's your fireworks. Yeah. Ah! So that's the quantitative <laughs> stuff. Let, let's look at the quantitative stuff. So uh, gross income and NOI are both up 20% from March to June, which is just a staggering climb. Uh, gross income from 203 to 248 and NOI from 145 to 174 uh, as a result of bringing those new units online. And you know, if we if we hadn't done the furnished thing, if we hadn't done the short-term thing, it would take a very long time to get all those new units producing revenue. You can pre-lease some, but it, just, it takes a long time to get the unit leased to line up a, a move-in. Whereas uh, with the short-term rentals, with furnished units, we're able to, to pre-order all of our furnishings you know, back in January get everything assembled, get everything staged up. And then we got literally, I think we had 30 people there moving furniture around the moment we got the certificates of occupancy, getting them listed on, you know, Airbnb and all the platforms, getting them producing revenue. And so to go from, uh, you know, uh, from March to June to produce, you know, 20% more NOI, that's just, that's staggering. So uh, when we bought this building, uh, we assumed in-place financing at 2.3%. 2.3%. So yeah, we're, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and assume that financing versus, you know, at the time prevailing rates were probably 9% or something like that. Uh, and we bought this building with just 3 million down, just a, an insanely small down payment. Um, so to, to get to, you know, our new financing, we're at, you know, like a high LTV, so to speak, we've added a staggering amount of value to this asset, adding those units, uh, you know, improving the NOI of the building drastically, but it's still, it's still a, a huge uh, hurdle, a huge goal to hit. Um, right now we're targeting loan proceeds of $22.5 million. And that would get us to essentially a, uh, you know, a cash neutral financing event. Uh, you know, if we weren't able to get that much in loan proceeds, we'd have to put cash in at the refi. If we're able to get more loan proceeds than that, we'd get cash out at the refi. So far, things are looking pretty good for a cash neutral refi. If we're able to pull that off, I mean, it's going to be pretty impressive, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm maybe complimenting myself and saying that just it's a it's a very tough challenge to to achieve this. And so far, things are looking pretty good. Uh, we'll count our chickens when they hatch. But so far, things are looking looking pretty darn good. Absolutely. Uh, oh, and this oh. is why we uh, haven't. So we have a huge amount of liquidity on hand right now, both in fund one and fund two. I can't I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's about 
3.8 million combined. Yeah. So we have a, just a staggering amount of liquidity on hand and we want to keep that cash right now in case we need it, in case, you know, we have to do put cash into the, the refinance event at RDS. Uh, once we get to the other side of that refi event at RDS, then we can think about, you know, how much cash do we want to hold in our operating reserves versus returning to investors? We have a pretty, pretty huge amount of liquidity on hand just to be ready. Uh, there's the old saying that uh, banks only like to lend money to people who don't need it. So they love seeing that we have all these liquid reserves and having those liquid reserves makes it more likely the bank will give us a bigger loan. Absolutely. All right, let's transition into fund two. So fund two is a $30 million fund closed in December of 2022. Um, we then completed our acquisitions. It ended up with nine total assets, half of RDS. So we've already covered one of those. Um, and then about a third of the assets are in Tacoma and two thirds are here in Rochester. Tanara Villa is what we consider to be the cornerstone of Fund 2. This was the first acquisition. Um, this is a large community in Tacoma that we're doing an exhaustive renovation. This was a 1970s building that really had never been renovated. And so and there's class A new construction all around it. So it's a great way to, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats to benefit from buying a community that's in an area that's improving, but then to help it match its peers. Um, we've completed 30 heavy renovations. A heavy renovation is what we consider to be like taking out the existing kitchen, existing bathroom, those sorts of things. Um, that's double the number of units that we completed last quarter. No, no, no. In the last quarter, we doubled the number of total yes, thank completed renovations. Yeah. So, th thank you for, yeah. for stating that the right way. Um, just really putting the pedal to the metal. It's it's the, you know, just like in um, Rochester, Tacoma's, you know, somewhat seasonal. So really trying to benefit from this spring and summer renovation season. We've completed 20 light uh, rehabs. We've successfully reorganized our construction loans. So that's always a moving target as you find that like, hey, the kitchens are a little cheaper than we thought, but the plumbing for the washer and dryer are a little more expensive. We're just always in communication with the bank, moving those numbers around. So we completed that in the last probably 60 to 90 days. So that's been good. Um, new financing is coming this September. We're very excited about that to continue on the next phases of renovation um, at Tanara. We will have completed all of our common area improvements by September, both inside and out. That's huge for a campus of this size with the number of units and the amount of lawn space there is. And a big part of our value add plan here was a huge exterior common living arrangement with like pergolas and a pickleball court and a dog park and all of the amenities that people expect today that they didn't expect in the 1970s. It was just this, you know, grass, which was pretty nice, but doesn't necessarily change the value of the community. Um, and so we've poured over a million dollars into exterior renovations here. And we're finally getting to yeah. enjoy that and see that come to fruition. It's the largest renovation we've ever done. And it's got a just a monster messy middle to it. And uh, we have a financing event coming up this September. We already have really good financing uh, lined up, but we're trying to get even better financing lined up. So we literally, we're not doing renovations on any of our other Tacoma buildings right now. We've got every single guy swinging a hammer here. I'm going to go personally walk every single rehab uh, in, uh, in Tanara uh, next, uh, next month. And uh, we're feeling really good about the crazy amount of you know, ground we've gained here. Um, but set that aside, let's just look at the numbers here because the numbers, they're pretty staggering. Uh, great financing option in place at 6.5, 6.25% fixed. Uh, but we really want to be able to get more construction financing to continue uh, our renovation project. So we're looking for additional better financing options. Um, our rent roll uh, is $145,000 for the month of July for, for July 1st. That's gone up 45% since Q1. Uh, that's that's just an insane, like it's, it seems absurd saying that number. It's just such, it's a 130 unit community. It's a huge community to have a 45% climb in rent roll in one quarter. That's just how much progress we've gone from having rehab down units everywhere. The common areas are just torn apart. Our clubhouse. Bulldozers everywhere. Yeah, yeah. like you can't. It looks ridiculous. You can't lease a unit in, <laughs> when it looks that way. And, and things are finally starting to like get to our finished product. And so our rent rates have just skyrocketed. You can see that chart with rent growth. You know, it's uh, you know, almost a 50%, you know, 40% climb in rental rate. Um, there's no vacancy. It might be one vacancy at this time. Uh, and then we do have two short-term rentals there. Uh, I had a note because uh, we had a we had a local celebrity that booked booked with us but did not stay. And uh, I don't know. We just have funny stories on our property sometimes. <laughs> Kensington and Lauriston are in fund too. They're also in Tacoma. They're in downtown Tacoma. 
again, surrounded by all brand new class A construction. These are 1960s builds. They're not neighbors. There is one building in between them, but functionally they kind of function as neighbors. Um, we have four units down for rehab. We've completed 11 heavy renovations. This is about 65 units total. So that's a, a lot of renovations since our acquisition there. Um, eight of our lighter renovations are complete. And then that means our rent roll is up 16% in the last quarter. So I hope you're seeing the pattern here. Crazy that numbers. At first, it's a lot of work and a lot of capital and a lot of vacancy and a lot of like that messy middle, right? Like, you know, improving, say, common areas is a great example of that. If you are, if you live there already and you're walking through the hallways and you see, say, you know, walls coming down and paint and other things, that's exciting. If you're shopping for an apartment unit there, it's maybe less exciting during those phases. So we really try to put the pedal to the metal to minimize that time frame there. And then during that post renovation period, it's very exciting. And so you see this pattern over and over and over again. Um, so our rent roll is up 16% in the last quarter. We are gonna try for one short-term rental unit here and we have very low vacancy. The showers here are like my favorite in the whole They're portfolio. Nice. They're so have a, nice. I have a funny video of myself standing in one of those showers. Look at that rent chart. Uh, this is average rental rate. So September, 2023, it was 900 bucks. And, uh, and today, June, 2024, uh, almost 1200. These are just, this is ridiculous to be able to achieve this sort of rent growth in a, in a one year period. So this, this project has been just a runaway success. Garfield's also in fun too. We have zero vacant units. We've completed 10 renovations there. We have no renovations in progress right now. The rent roll is up 25% in the last quarter. It's kind of <laughs> going back to the beginning. I was like, man, this, this quarterly update, yeah. like the portfolio is maturing. Like yeah. this is the work of, all of the quarters of putting in the, you know, we're doing this renovation and that and putting in this amount of dollars. And this is the vacancy that comes from all of that. And then this is the like golden part. And then the really wonderful part is when it converts to the cash out refi. Um, the rent rolls up 56% since February. So it's 25% in just the last quarter and then 56% since February. Um, this is a building that has some ground floor commercial and our commercial rent roll is up 12% in the last quarter. Um, and then we did add one short-term rental here. So the bulk of our short-term rentals are here in Rochester, but we're experimenting with them in Tacoma, which is pretty common, right? We think of Rochester as like our headquarters where we pilot projects, we build the systems and processes, all of those things. And then we take those learnings to Tacoma. And so you're seeing that with addition of short-term rentals in Tacoma. So uh, Jenny just asked, are rents increasing or is it just units coming online? So that's why we have the chart. Excellent question. We have the chart that shows the average rental rate. And then we say what the total rent roll is. So it's that the rents are going up on a per unit basis and we are filling the units at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's how it's financially feasible to have a 56% you know, uh, rent roll increase since February because you have to increase the per unit rental rate and you have to fill the units. Yep. And then the question was, are these rent rolls sustainable? Um, as far as we can tell, right? So we're always balancing um, if we push our rental rates and that increases vacancy, well, then that means we've probably pushed a little too hard, right? But then people are choosing to live in other communities. But if we can push rental rates while keeping vacancy low, that tells us that we're in the sweet spot of the market. Um, and when we, when we build out our pro formas, we don't build into our pro formas ongoing um, kind of market uh, rental rate escalation. So we don't build in like, oh, we predict that rates will go up or that rents will go up, you know, 3% per year or 4% per year. We build into our pro formas the rent at the time of acquisition and what we predict the rent will be after renovation. And then everything beyond that is just gravy so that we're already exceeding the numbers that we predicted we would get at after our renovations tells us that we're doing well and that from there, we just kind of have to hold steady. It's so also very, critical very to good know, question. like if you go go back to Kensington there, so directly across the street from Kensington, Lorston is an asset called the Ruby. So your rental rates at the Ruby, $3,000 a month, 3,000. In fact, every single neighbor around Kensington and Lorston, the rental rates are double or triple our rental rates. So uh, we're taking, you know, the least nice house in the block, pulling it up to where it's a, a clean, nice, safe place to live. But our rents are still literally like half of our next door neighbors in many cases. Very good. It is the top of the hour. So we're going to go a little bit faster. Um, to, you, can, you can catch the replay if you need to hop off. 
Um, essentially, it's kind of this same story repeating over and over and over at the different assets. Douglas Trail is in Fund 2 here in Rochester. This is a 100-unit townhome community. You can think of Douglas Trail and Georgetown, which is going into Fund 3 and Fund 4, as kind of like brother assets. They're built around the same time, basically the same size. They're both townhome communities. So we're 90% renovated there which is huge for a hundred unit townhome community. Um, we are now in the early conversations for our cash out refi there. Um, after our renovation, we've rebranded it to Dakota townhomes to get the marketing lift that we know we can get from all of the physical improvements that we've made there. Um, and then this directly informs our business plan for Georgetown. Our January rent roll was 108 thousand and our July rent roll is now 127,000 so about a 25 percent increase there and we have no vacant units for the first time in I guess since we've owned it at one so point that's been huge at one point we had 45 vacant units 45 vacant yeah units. during the construction project we had we had five acres of vacant units so just imagine the operational stress of renovating all those units at once. Man, it, it, Dakota looks amazing. It's yeah. absolutely amazing. We drive by it every Sunday. That's like our little like Sunday drive with the kids. Um, Old City Hall, um, our renovations are complete there. Our income is skyrocketing. Um, our Q1 NOI, NOI is most important, right? Because NOI encompasses both income and expenses. So our Q1 NOI was 13,000. Our Q3 NOI is- Or Q2, sorry. Uh, I had a typo there. Okay, so I'm sorry. Q2 NOI was 13,000 and then Q2- Q, Q1 to Q2. Okay, I got it. Q2 was- 27,000. So a doubling of our NOI in just one quarter. Um, on our long-term rental side, we just signed a lease renewal at 2,500 per month. Um, so very excited about that. We had predicted that these units might rent around say 2,000, 2,200. So we're exceeding the numbers that we projected at the time of acquisition. We've had about 25% rent growth in the past two years. 50% of that comes from the renovations, about 50% of that comes from management improvements. And then this building is just so charming, right? Because it was literally the old city hall of Rochester. It's a 1920s art deco building. Um, people that have been here for real estate real life know the size of these windows. They're like 25 feet windows. We need to measure them someday so that we like know, but a whole human can stand in them and not hit that like center wood part, part of the, um, you come up the like window. first pain. Yeah. yeah. Um, so people love to rent it. You know, people don't come to Rochester because they're on vacation. They come to Rochester because they're sick. But if they can get a little bit of like a vacation feel when they're here, of course they like that, right? Of course they want to get a little local culture or something neat to minimize the pain of having to come to Rochester for medical care. Um, and so this rents extraordinarily well. People love it. They love the natural light. They love the location. It's walkable to several restaurants. It's it's so good. It's Nick's favorite in the portfolio. He, he, we we he, went on a date. He doesn't uh, have last a favorite, week. but if he did, it would be Old City Hall. We, we went on a date last week. We got some dinner, and then we went and visited City Hall. Yeah, I'm like trying to talk to Nick, and Old City Hall's behind me, and it's like a it's like a different lover. He's just like looking past my face at Old City Hall, and I almost wanted to start saying like random words like pink elephant and just. <laughs> I was looking longingly at at you, my love. Not. Not at City Hall. City Hall is it's a distant second. I love it. Um, Riverview, um, 63 unit building. We acquired about 45 of the units all at once. And then we're working on acquiring the rest of the units in the community so that we can officially convert this into an apartment building. Right now it's technically a condominium HOA, uh, but we do have a controlling stake of the HOA. Uh, we've closed on five total units in Q2 of this year. So that's another reason why we're keeping liquidity in fund too, is we acquire all of those units with cash and then do a little renovation and then go and uh, do the refi on those. Um, we have one short-term rental here. It's been very successful. We're going to bring um, some more short-term rentals on here. Parking's really easy. It's in a great part of town. There are large units. They're ADA accessible. There's just a lot of reasons why it will likely um, do very well on short-term rental. Colby? Colby's doing great. Uh, we've renovated half the units. We're able to pay our, our you know current debt service on it. This is the asset where it appreciated a million dollars in nine months uh, with uh, all the value add that we've done there. 
And uh, we expect this will be eligible for additional cash out refi in the near future if we don't redevelop it. So uh, you can see the rent growth there from June 2023, where we were at 725 a month. And as of June 2024, so one year later, we went from 725 to 975. Uh, so it's 50% or not 50%, that's 30% rent growth or something like that in a single year. Just just a staggering improvement at, uh, at Colby. Yep. A lot of like uh, every asset, you know, with I don't think there's any exceptions. Uh, every asset just had a killer Q2, just an absolutely killer Q2. Uh, you can, you know, like it's just like this chart where, you know, the, the the this is the high season. This is when we do a lot of new leases. This is when we do a lot of new renewals. And we had great rent growth and and filled a ton of vacancy. We have the lowest portfolio wide vacancy that we've had in two years, and all the financials reflect that. Um, Colby it has become kind of a community for like PhD scientists, um, international postdocs, those sorts of things. The units are somewhat small. They're, they're technically do have a one bedroom, but you can see here you're kind of standing in the kitchen and it to your back would be the living room. And then to the front is the bedroom and there's no door there. So they're kind of like a, like a mix between like a studio and a one bedroom. Um, so it's a lot of single folks who are coming, you know, not only from different parts of the country, but different parts of the world. Maybe they don't have a driver's license. It's walkable to Mayo. It's a very affordable price point. They don't have a lot of furniture or personal belongings. So they like the kind of small, cozy um, uh, footprint here. Col Colby has done very well. Let's transition to fund three. So we opened fund three in February of 2024. It's a $15 million fund. Um, we have three assets earmarked for fund three, and then that is um, the placement of all of the capital. We did also acquire a triplex and a few single family homes. We may add in a few more single family homes as time goes on because those are just you know such smaller capital expenditures in the fund, but you can really think of um, fund three as the apartment buildings that we have listed here. And then fund three is full. So we'll have uptown apartments here in Rochester, um, Bayswater and Bay Crest in Tacoma, which despite their very similar names are completely unrelated communities. Um, and then fund three will own half of Georgetown and half of Boulder Ridge. So we uh, just closed on Baycrest and Bay's Water in Q2 of this year. Uh, everything went really well. Uh, Baycrest is probably our smoothest transition in Tacoma. We tend to buy frankly, steeply distressed assets in Tacoma. Uh, so this was a, a rare asset where you know, it was a relatively straightforward transition, not a lot of uh, escalations to manage. Uh, we got three vacant units, two are getting a light remodel and one will be our first heavy rehab. And then uh, Bay's Water, uh, this was a hilarious, not good situation where uh, the, the owner literally did nothing during our entire contract period, which was a lengthy contract period. That's why you're so, so aggressive with Georgetown. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> hey, we should have pre -lead. So literally they showed us like some vacant units and then we went to you know do like our final walkthrough right before closing, and we're like, uh, these same units are still vacant. And they're like, yeah, I mean the building was selling, so like why would we lease anything? It was just it was wild. There was a, two abandoned units that closed. And that's pretty unusual. Uh, two units will get a light rehab, three will get a medium rehab, and we're already moving uh, things forward to uh, eliminate. Uh, to, so the the income restriction is set to expire here in less than a year. So we're starting to get all the puzzle pieces in place for that asset, uh, and then that asset will increase drastically in value here in less than a year. So lots and uh, lots and lots of paperwork. Two very successful closings. Yeah. We closed on Uptown. We closed on this one the day before my birthday. So that was pretty fun. Um, this is uh, right here in Rochester, part of our downtown campus. Um, 1650 per month, average rent, extremely smooth transition. Um, we acquired it from a local owner, a local property management company that we've worked with many, many times. Um, no major renovations here. Our main plan here is management improvements, um, very similar to say like Nicholas or New 52, which was one of our historic JV projects. Um, and then we did have a rent guarantee because there was um, some excess vacancy at closing. And so when we negotiated a rent guarantee that gave us, you know, in terms of our rent roll, 100% occupancy for the first 90 days after closing, which then gave us time to fill those units. And we've been successful with that through the peak of the leasing season. So it's kind of stabilized. Like we, we bought it in April, we leased it through the last couple of months, and now it will just, you know, be a steady performer for fund three until we're able to do a capital I love the, I love the chart on this. We, we've only owned it for like, you know, 60 days or something like that. So we don't yet have a rent growth chart, but uh, it'll look good here soon. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, fund three uh, and fund four are splitting Georgetown and Boulder Ridge. 50% of each asset is going into fund three, fund four. Uh, that deploys capital in fund three and uh, deploys most of the capital in fund four. Mm -hmm. 
Georgetown, hopefully we're going to close here in the next couple of weeks, uh, working through all the final details there. 132 townhome units. We were just there this morning. The place is gorgeous, 16-acre campus, uh, deeply distressed property. Uh, we have an appraisal in hand on that asset for $22.86 million. Our contract price is $20.1 million. You heard that right. We're walking in with you know, two and a half to $3 million of equity day one, just a, a distressed seller that, that has to sell. And then we've got a huge amount of value add we're going to do on top of that. This is a just a crazy good deal that we're getting on Georgetown. Uh, and then Boulder Ridge is, is much the same. Uh, we're buying this thing for 33%, uh, 32% less than uh, the direct sale comp. Uh, that, that we offered on, you know, 18 months ago. Uh, we're walking in with millions of dollars of equity on this asset, another distressed seller uh, on this asset as well. Uh, that's, I mean, that's just where we're at in the marketplace. Groups that did not prepare for the season that we're in, they have to sell. They have to sell regardless of, you know, what they think the asset is worth, what they know the asset is worth. It's just, is there a buyer who who is willing to pay that's you know not underwater themselves on their existing portfolio? So we're unbelievably excited to you know to launch Fund Four hot on the heels of Fund Three, and frankly, just buy everything we possibly can right now because this is this is the best we've ever seen in terms of uh, buying conditions. So Boulder Ridge is just another just an unbelievably good deal that we're we're getting on this particular asset. You want to talk about the debt that we have in place mm -hmm. for? Um... Georgetown and Boulder Ridge? Yeah. So on Georgetown, uh, we're currently contemplating a, an interest rate as low as 5.5%. And that's because we're getting Fannie Mae financing and Fannie is giving us credit for the fact that it's a, an income restricted community. Some of its market rates, some of its income restricted uh, and various other uh, factors related to its affordability, our track record as uh, sponsors, uh, the way we're structuring that. So we're getting uh, five years fixed at five point, uh, potentially as low as 5.5%. Uh, and that allows for supplemental refi as well. So a really clear path to a cash out refi in five years and a substantial cash out refi probably in just a couple of years on Georgetown. Just a fantastic deal on the debt that we're getting there. Lots of interest only period. Um, just, a, just a fantastic loan we're getting there. And then for Boulder Ridge, we're in the process of assuming a HUD loan at four and a half percent. So again, and, you know, prevailing market rate, uh, you know, interest rates out there might be like seven and a half percent. We're walking into Georgetown at five and a half percent. We're walking to Boulder Ridge at four and a half percent. So it's it's just we're, we're getting fantastic, fantastic debt on these assets. Uh, you have to be a little bit creative about it. It's I mean, I have probably spent at least 100 hours of my time working on the debt on these deals. And sadly, I'm just getting started on Boulder Ridge. The HUD loan assumption process is quite laborious. Uh, but the, the debt makes the deal. So at a time when people are saying, you know, interest rates are too high, you can't do deals. Uh, we're one of the few people who are buying. Brokers are calling me every single day saying, hey, Nick, are you buying? Hey, Nick, are you buying? Hey, Nick, are you buying? And so we're getting just phenomenal pricing and we're still able to get very good deals on our debt. Yep. Um, another great question, Jenny. You're on fire today with yeah. some really good questions. Um, how do you handle assets spread across two funds? Um, so all the money goes in on the same day. And if, if additional money is needed, it's split 50-50. And then when profit comes out, it goes into that entity account, like say RDS, for example. And then when profits are ready to go out to the funds, they just go out 50-50. So it's, there's, there's no like additional variables or complexities or anything there. Because our acquisitions and our funds have been stacked up relatively close in time, that has made a ton of sense. Like we wouldn't, for example acquire an asset like 50% between fund one and fund four, because those funds are years apart in age. But when we acquire an asset that the funds themselves are only like six months apart in age or so, then we just, it's all just directly proportional. So good question there. Okay. Um, a little bit about fund four. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you've already heard about um, Georgetown and, um, uh, Boulder Ridge, the acquisitions that half will go in fund three, half will go in fund four. Um, and then we have closed and we are moving dirt on Stonehaven Apartments. Um, so this is what we think of as Stonehaven phase four. So we've been building our Stonehaven community for about four years now. And then we acquired a parcel just like 100 feet away, and we're building Stonehaven Apartments, which is a 56-unit apartment building. Um, we broke ground, so the bulldozers are there. They're moving dirt. Things are going really well. We have um, an in-house person who checks on Stonehaven probably, I would say, maybe three, four days a week and sends us pictures and everything. It's just a ton of fun to see that come to life. So we'll focus on that. Um, we already covered Georgetown and Boulder Ridge. I was going to 
cover some more information about those. But since we're past the, the top of the hour, we'll focus on Stonehaven. Um, I hadn't even thought about it, but like Stonehaven is like in flight. We need to like do a fund update, you know, on fund four. This yeah. Is, this is like just the capital efficiency that we're able to raise the capital and deploy the capital that fast. It's just, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, so we've been working on this land for about 18 months and we just worked on that with our own personal capital. We knew that we would eventually drop it into a fund whenever it was ready. So a lot of people have asked, well, you know, what about new construction and the timeline there? I've heard new construction takes a long time. Well, it does take a long time. So we've been working on this behind the scenes, acquiring the land, getting the utilities ready, getting approved for residential zoning. It was zoned commercial. We got the city to change the zoning to residential, getting approved for a unit density increase because more units equals more profit. Most importantly, we got approved for a $300,000 tax abatement from the city of Byron. So that basically means that over the first seven years, we'll pay drastically lower taxes. And that's a win-win for the developer to develop those units and to have that seven-year period of increased profitability. And then starting in year eight and onward, the city gets tax revenue that they otherwise wouldn't have received at all. So tax abatements are really favorable to enhance development. We completed all of the work with our architect and our builder, um, and the building will be complete in spring of 2025. We expect to have the delivery in March or April of 2025. Delivery is like the word when you get your certificate of occupancy and you can start moving people into those units. Um, and that's just in time for our busy leasing season. So we fully expect that by this time next year, we will have an extreme majority of the units rented because we will have started the pre-leasing in, say, like January, received our certificate of occupancy in, say, April, and then moving people in through that busy leasing season. And it's because of the efficiencies here of being able to build Stonehaven phase one, two, and three over the last four years, kind of working on this other piece of land behind the scenes and then dropping it into a fund when it was ready that fund four doesn't have to absorb any of that timeline or risk. It gets a fully developed project. We actually closed on the Stonehaven Apartments construction loan hours before our fund for launch, which just like cracked us up, cracked up the banker. Like he's like, you're buying this with like an entity that like doesn't even exist. I'm like, well, it'll exist tonight at 7 p.m. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. Um, a lot of this we've already covered in um, in our uh, well, fund for launch webinar. Go ahead. One critical thing to note on Sony Apartments is uh, we have an appraisal in hand. So there's a question about appraised value. So our total development cost on this is probably about $9.5 million and our appraisal uh, as complete is $11.5 million. So we know we've got a minimum of $2 million of day one equity on Georgetown, Boulder Ridge, and Stonehaven Apartments. And we have appraisals in hand to support that. Uh, this is not just a, not just an opinion. Um, these are just these are just phenomenal deals. Uh, and and on the debt there, uh, we have an eighty percent LTC loan. So you might hear people out there say, well, you can't get a construction loan over sixty percent LTC or something. Uh, it's unheard of to get an eighty percent LTC loan right now. I don't know of a single other uh, developer that's getting that. It's just because it's a really good deal. We were able to really stack up our advantages. We we're able to really ratchet down our replacement costs. I could geek out for hours and all the ways we. Um, uh, you know, got our construction costs as low as possible. We're still building, you know, class A beautiful units. Uh, and that allows us to create a lot of, a lot of day one equity. So I'm mm -hmm. uh, really excited to see this project move forward and I can't wait to see it, uh, see it complete. Yep. Um, another question came in, will you sell the completed asset to fund for? So Stonehaven Apartments is owned by fund for yep. all of the, all of the value, all of the equity created. It owns the $2 million of equity. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. Yep. It, it's already owned by fund four. Yeah, there's, good, there's good question, profit yeah. built into the to the to the fund from the get go. I think these pictures are probably maybe about a week old um, so that even more work has happened since these pictures came to us. Yep. Um, so we've had to take down some trees, do some leveling, all of those things. It's been it's been so fun to see this like even like, I don't know, even stereotypically, like as a woman, like bulldozers are just exciting. Like I, like I know our little, we have one daughter and then three little boys and then another little boy on the way. And they are just like mesmerized. Like when we bring them into like this office and they like see the computers, they're like, nah, what my parents do is like, whatever. But when we take them out to see the bulldozers, like, ah, it's so fun. Um, so we'll have some updated pictures, like on our social media and our emails and keep you guys informed about the new construction happening in Stonehaven. So fun. That is everything. 
Um, there's some summary slides there. We'll make sure those get into the email. If you'd like to participate in Fund 4, it is still open. I anticipate it might fill in the next, say, several weeks. Um, BlackSwanFund4.com. It's a $15 million fund. We're at a little over $11 million in commitments, so there is still a little space. I do find that when we get to the end, it kind of fills very quickly. Um, so if you're thinking about it, if you have any questions, want to schedule a call with Nick or I, have technical questions for Rachel, we're here to support you with that decision. Um, we're very excited about Fund 3 and Fund 4. I mean, we're excited about all the funds. I hope you're seeing how Fund 1 and Fund 2 have matured mm -hmm. and that the, like, the, the golden period is happening for those earlier funds. Um, we're not going to grow the rent roll 45% uh, every quarter. But that we can do it even a single quarter ever is uh, just incredible uh, kind of financial alchemy. And there's just such an interesting time in the market right now um, to benefit from kind of the distress that started in 2021, 2022, um, when sellers were buying with those historically low interest rates. And now, you know, with their variable rate debt. They have you know, no way out from that except to sell. And we're happy to be there to scoop those up and put them into our pipeline, which is the same, which has always been long-term fixed rate debt, um, value add plans, vertical integration with our property management, and just do that over and over and over again. So if you want to be a part of that, you can join us at blackswanfund4.com. I think we hit all of the questions. Um, if any question, if you had any question and we didn't get a chance to answer it or you're catching the replay, um, you can just respond to the replay email that lands right in my inbox and we'll make sure that you get an answer. If you have any technical questions around like the portal distributions, your password, those sorts of things, Rachel is certainly very happy to help you with that. Um, and then otherwise, just keep an eye out for when we have our next community power hour, our next quarterly update, lots of fun stuff. Please do make sure you're following our social media. We put out a lot of stuff on Facebook and Instagram. And every once in a while, we'll have someone message in of like, I kind of, I haven't heard you know, what you guys are up to lately. Um, first of all, make sure our emails are landing in your inbox. We send out an email every Tuesday. Um, so make sure that's hitting your inbox. And then we try to put something on social media almost every day because right? we're out at the assets. We're working with our team like, this is, this, is, this is what we do with our time. And so we're updating that. Um, so those are great ways to stay in touch with us in between the quarterly reports. In addition to the replay in the replay email, um, there is a written format for people that prefer that, maybe want to look through it more quickly or a little more visual or like to read. So there is that written PDF as well. Um, and then super grateful to Rachel and Precious, who's also in our marketing department. We now have a static spot on our website. Um, I believe it's meetblackswan.com forward slash performance, but don't quote me on that. Check the email. If you're listening to the replay, check the email for the exact link there. Um, yep, Rachel's telling me blackswanteam.com forward slash performance, blackswanteam.com forward slash performance. And that's going to have all of our quarterly updates going back several years to the inception of Fund One with both a direct link to the YouTube video and then a direct link to that written brochure format all in that one place. Lots of people want to see the trends over time. So we, we created that. Really appreciate, uh, I think Victoria had a comment there if you scroll up a tiny bit. Thank you so much. This level of transparency is unique and really appreciated. Your team is amazing and I'm very grateful for everyone's hard work. We uh, we appreciate you, Victoria, and uh, appreciate you recognizing that. I hope that we ever get so big that we can't do these like, you know, very uh, intimate town hall uh, kind of uh, updates where we're able to answer questions and people can show up live and see what's going on. Uh, you know, we think we'll have probably a billion dollars in assets under management in the not so distant future. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we can't do it the way we like to do it, then then what's the point? So we love just being able to connect with our investors and, and let them know what's going on. Absolutely. And come out to our event in person yes. in September of 2025. Get on the that bus. is like super fun. See like, the assets. like if you like Zoom, getting on the bus is like a whole new level. So we'd yeah. love to have you um, here in Rochester. And we will eventually have an event in Tacoma as well, maybe in 2026. Thank you, everyone, either those of you that were able to stay with us through our whole live presentation or those of you catching the replay. If you need anything, we're here for you. Otherwise, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye, Bye everyone.